Hi, I'm Chris Kamish, and this is CS361, Systems Programming. Today's video is about symbol resolution. So the main topic of what we've been talking about so far is building from a source code to a running program. One of the really important intermediate points of this is creating the object files that are the output of the compiler that has taken our source file and turned it into assembly code and some extra things that we're eventually going to need to fix later on. That is that intermediate is that intermediate file has a whole bunch of assembly instructions for the code that we wrote, but it also has references to code that other people wrote that eventually needs to be incorporated into our program to make it actually runnable. So in this case, we've got things like puts and fprintf that exist in this file as references to functions, but we can't jump to them yet because the definition isn't in here. Even if we let the preprocessor open up stdio.h and jam it into this file, it's not going to have the definition of printf, it's not going to have the definition of puts, it's just going to have definitions for the signatures of those functions so we know how to call them. It doesn't give us the body of those functions. To get the body of those functions, we're going to need to do relocation but before we do relocation, we need to do symbol resolution to figure out which puts do we want, which fprintf do we want, and things along those lines. So the, we're going to take a quick step back here and talk about what even is a symbol. Because we should all know what variables are, right? Everything from increment to first time, basically anything in this slide that's a light shade of blue is a variable name. We've also got names for functions, which are also effectively variable names. They're, they're names for specific locations in memory that we can jump to and start executing machine code. So anything with a global or a module level name, which includes functions, our global variables, and our static variables are symbols. What's really important here is that symbols aren't always for connecting this file to functions or things that are defined in other places or vice versa, allowing them to connect to us. Static variables in C more or less function as private variables, if you remember. And so we've got two examples in this file. So we've got our static int invocations here, as well as this first time, which is specifically run within this function hello world. These are both static variables that are not visible at all to anyone else anywhere in the entire running program once it's been linked together but we still need to keep track of them as symbols because we're gonna move them around and give them their own specific home and memory when we turn this into a runnable executable file. And in fact, we can take this file and run it through readlf just like we do in homework one. That's what I'm gonna do right now. So let's take a look at this file. This is the same file I had on the PowerPoint slide. And what I wanna do is compile that file. So I'm gonna do gcc-c of static, oh, wrong, wrong directory. Here we are in the right directory. So here we are going to clear the screen and we are going to gcc static example.c. All right, and so that gives us a .o file, I believe. Yep, we've got static example.o. One thing that I usually do, one trick of the trade, I guess you could call it, is I'll very often list my files in reverse chronological order, which means it puts the newest file at the end of the list. And if I look at the end of that list, I can say, oh, this is a file that I just edited right now. So static example .o, just got it just got edited right now. That's the output of running gcc-c on static example. Now I can read ELF on static example .o, and I can be given the symbol table. So here are all of the symbols that GCC has created within this .o file. We've got our invocations, we've got our not defined here, we've got all of these things that are eventually going to need to, we're going to eventually need to know the homes of when we go and link this file together. Now that we have a basic idea of what a symbol is, it's a variable, but one that the linker needs to care about. Let's talk about other properties of them. Another important property is the binding. And this is something that I've kind of hinted at already. Static symbols are given local scope and everything else is given global scope. So every other symbol in here is going to end up in 
the symbol table as global type. What's really important here is this increment is not a symbol. It doesn't have anything. It's not, it wasn't in our VS code window. When we looked at the symbol table, it's not a symbol. It's, it is a variable. It's not a symbol. Now we've got both our global and our external global symbols. So global symbols are things here like message that are defined locally. So that's definitely a global symbol. However, things which could be defined someplace else are external symbols. So fprintf, standard error, and puts are all external symbols that are defined someplace else. Not defined here is itself also a global symbol because we did have it declared in this file. Now, all these symbols live in individual sections of this .o file. The .o file has a specific layout that was defined when Linux was becoming a thing. It looks a lot like the executable files you'll find on other Unix variants. The basic idea here is that in our text section, we have the assembly language of the code of all the functions that we had compiled using the compiler. We've got read-only data. So these are global variables that are read-only. We've got the regular data section, which is where we're going to put our read-write symbols, global variables. We've got the BSS section, which is a special section. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here. The basic idea is that BSS is where we put everything that we know when this program starts running will have the value zero. If something is always going to have the value zero, we get this nice efficient shortcut where we can say, rather than giving it space in that .o file on our hard drive, we're just gonna say that if it gets the default value, we keep track of it. We know how big it is, we know what type it is, we know what name it has, but we don't actually have to give it room in our file. So for instance, if we had a 4096 byte buffer that we know we need to have in memory when we run the program, and it starts with all zeros, we don't need to put 4096 zeros in our executable file on the disk. We just remember that when we created it on in memory, we expanded out into zeros. So BSS is where all of those symbols that we know start as zero live. And the easy mnemonic we have for that is that even though BSS stands for something like base segment size or base segment system segment, blah, 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 in 361, we remember it by calling it better save space. And we save that space by not giving it any space for the variable values in the .o file. We still have it in the symbol table, but we don't have it in the .o file as an actual section that has a size. The BSS section itself has zero size but there are still symbols that live in the BSS section. It has no size on disk. The next important thing is the symbol table. That's what we read over there in that VS code window to figure out what all the symbols are in this file. We've got our relocation entries for text and data. Now, when we're using these symbols in the code of our program, or when we're referring to global variables that come from other files, they're not ready to go yet, right? This is an intermediary file that can't actually be executed itself. So every place that we have in our .o file that will eventually get changed has a relocation entry in it. We can think of these as to-dos that the compiler leaves for the linker to actually fix up when the executable gets created at the very end of the build process. The next three we have are the debug line and string table. These are not useful for running the program as a user, but they are really useful for running the program as a developer. The debug section gives us information about stack local variables and other generic things that make GCC able to do its job. The line section maps individual assembly instructions from our text section onto individual lines of the source C file. So that allows us to do super useful things like break on a line as opposed to finding the exact offset in the address space of an individual instruction and setting a breakpoint on that address. That way 
and that makes life much, much easier. And our string table, also super, super useful. This is the mapping between the symbol table entries and the actual string variable name that the humans use to refer to it. So super, super useful. That was used to figure out what those names were when we ran readlf and got the job done. Now, there's two special pseudo sections that we talked about in the book that are also important for us to remember. One is the common pseudo section. This is where we put anything that is uninitialized and global. Now note, common means uninitialized and global. It does not mean initialized to zero, and it does not mean static variables. Why common and BSS are different in that way and why any BSS variable, whether it's assigned to zero or uninitialized and static, goes into BSS and not into common is one of those great why questions that I would highly recommend you think about a little bit before you come to class on Thursday. And the undefined section is where we put every single symbol that's referenced here but isn't defined here, you know, hence the term undefined. This is where we're gonna say, you know, I know I need to find printf. I know I need to find puts. I know I need to find standard error, but I don't know where I'm gonna find them yet because they weren't defined here. The important part about that is that those symbols are eventually gonna go into one of our real symbol sections. They're eventually gonna end up in text or they're gonna eventually end up in data. But for now, they aren't in a section because we don't know where they're eventually going to live. So far, we've been talking about symbols as a thing that has a property, and we know what we're gonna eventually need to do. We're eventually gonna to need to do that relocation process of finding where the symbol lives and referring to it in our assembly code someplace else, but we're not there yet. We can't yet do our relocation. First, we need to do this resolution process. Now, the resolution process, in the best case scenario, is super easy. We've got a bunch of references, then we've got one definition, and the linker says, aha, this definition goes to these references. Done. However, that's not always gonna be the case. There's gonna be a lot of situations where there's more than one symbol definition, more than one symbol table entry coming from different .o files, and the linker has this responsibility of saying, okay, this doesn't necessarily mean something went wrong, but it could have, but this is C, so if there's any way I can make it work, even if it almost certainly isn't gonna do what you expect it to, it's still gonna happen. C is infamous for being a language that it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot in. So how are we gonna do the symbol resolution when there's a little ambiguity involved? First, symbols have, are of one of two types. They're either strong symbols, which are any functions that are defined, and any variables that are already initialized. We have weak symbols, which are any uninitialized variables. Now, every symbol fits into one of those two categories, and then we're gonna follow these three rules. If we're linking a bunch of .o files together, and one symbol name has two different strong symbols coming into our linking process, we're gonna quit. We're gonna error out, say this is not correct, something went wrong here, and you would expect and hope and imagine that what would probably cause that is I use some variable name like X to create something in my .o file like some temporary variable, and you also use that variable name X and you assigned it to something else there. And when you try to put those two things together, surprise, you almost certainly are gonna start clobbering each other's X values and one of us is gonna have to change. That rule, at least to me, makes intuitive sense. The next rule is that when there's a strong symbol and a weak symbol, pick the strong symbol. And this makes sense. If we're going to be referencing something from someplace else, it does make sense to just declare it so that we can eventually use it. Whereas if somebody else actually defines it, initializes it, et cetera, it makes sense that we're gonna use that defined initialized version rather than the declaration that we had in our own file. This is gonna come back to bias us in just a few moments. And then when there are multiple weak symbols, the compiler and the standard, the C standard just says, you know what, I don't care. You're doing weird stuff that is probably going to mess up, but I'm not gonna complain about it. I'm just gonna pick one and move on with my life because I ain't got time for that. 
both of these can very easily lead to weirdness. Well, the multiple weak can lead to really nasty weirdness and the one strong one weak can still lead to weirdness. We're gonna see that right now. So let's come back over to our handy dandy VS Code window. And here I have a weak library and a weak main. So this weak main has a strong definition of an X and a strong definition of a Y and it refers to this function f, and we're going to print out our global variables y and our global variable x. So what we would expect to happen here is that this prints out ba, and then it finishes. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Let's go back over here to weak library. It's got a weak definition of x. It's got a weak declaration of x, so this is going to get overruled by that char x in the other file. But that already sounds a little weird because aren't integers four bytes and aren't characters one? We gotta like keep track of these things and figure out what's going on. And now in F, we take X, which is a four byte integer, and we set its two least significant bytes to these two lines, to these two bytes, three B, two nine. Yeah, so that's what it's gonna do. Let's see what happens when we put these two things together. Let's do a make clean. We're in here and we're going to do a make weak symbols. So we compile weak main, we compile weak library, we try to link them together and the linker is already complaining to us. It's warning us saying, you know, your alignment of X and your alignment of X in, or your alignment of X in one file and your alignment of X in the other file don't match up. When we're looking at an integer, integers can only be stored on addresses that are evenly divisible by four. They need to be word aligned. So if you have address zero, let's, so if you have address 8,000, you can store an integer there, but you can't store an integer at 8,001, 8,002, or 8,003. You can store an integer at 8,004, but not five, six, seven. You can at eight, not nine A, B, C, nine A, B, but you can at nine at C, et cetera. However, when you're storing characters, just individual bytes, you can store them wherever you want. You can store a character at address 8,000, you can store a character at address 8,001, character at 8,002, et cetera, et cetera. This brings me to another point that's pretty important that I haven't actually brought up yet. And in previous semesters, it's something that it didn't seem was brought up earlier. So this, this brings me to another relatively important point about the way that we think about memory in the computer. So when we are looking at memory, and I'll draw this more than once during the course of the semester, trust me, one way we can think about this is that there are L values and there are R values. So L values are addresses and R values are the stored information in memory. So every cell of memory has these two different values associated with it, an L value and an R value. When we're thinking about pointers, this becomes a super useful concept to keep in mind. So L values are addresses and they're almost always contiguous. They're almost always byte address. So they in increment by one every single time we move through it. So very, very often, if we're looking at an address space layout, we're going to have something that looks like 8,000, 8,001, 8,002, 8,003, 8,004, et cetera. And then when we're talking about memory and they're byte addressable and each individual byte that's being addressed obviously stores an individual byte. And we're thinking about this in terms of unsigned integers. This first cell of memory can store any value between zero and 255. This next cell of memory can store anything from zero to 255 and so on. Every single cell of memory can have those values. Sometimes we can interpret them differently. So an easy thing for us to do is think about these as individual integers, but we could also think about them as groups of four integers that comprise a full on int. So if we, if we interpret these rather than as individual character based values, but instead interpret them as 32 bits of value, that can be actually anything from zero to two to the 32, 
minus one. Those four bytes, when taken as an integer, can be interpreted as that. The really important thing for what I'm talking about right now with this character x and this integer x is that the processor doesn't know anything about how many bytes and in are stored there. C is untyped. Every single one of these bytes just has eight bits in it. Those eight bits can be interpreted as an integer from zero to 255, four different ones. It can be interpreted as four bytes that are all together, so the 32 bits, and that can be interpreted as any value from zero to two to the 32 minus one. It can be interpreted as characters, as ASCII characters, as UTF-8 characters, as floating point numbers, all these different ways that we can potentially think about those values in memory, they're all referred to in exactly the same way. So if we have an X, which is a character, it is going to point at that value 8,000. So if we have char X, and now if we have int X, it doesn't have any information about how long it is. All it has is there is an integer, it starts at address 8,000, and the compiler just kind of understands implicitly that if it starts at value 8,000, it takes up 0, 1, 2, 3. And if it's a character and it starts at x, then it takes up 8,000. And probably some other character or some other thing is stored at 8,001, some other thing is stored at 8,002, etc. So what happens if we go back over to our VS Code window, when we go look at what this function does, it's going to wipe out x, but it probably going to do some other things. You might want to pause the video right now, run, think about it yourself. I'm about to run this program in three, two, one. Weak symbols. Boom. Okay, so that showed us a winky face, and that's not necessarily what we expected. If you expected that, pretty awesome. I did give you some hints there on that explanation of L values and R values, but it still doesn't make uh, too terribly much sense. So let's go and debug this program, right? So let's, I created a debugger setting before we started this. Let's get rid of this window. Okay, cool. So I've got my weak main, I've got my weak library, and I told VS Code, as soon as you get to the first line of main, break. So, and I also set watch points for X, Y, and this fancy thing right here, which we will see what they do in a moment. So we start this up and we see that we get to F and things are more or less what we expect. X has the ASCII value A, Y has the ASCII value B, and we're about to run F. Well, let's just run F and get down to our printf. Okay, so even though F only modified X, it still had the side effect of modifying y as well. What the heck happened there? Well, it's the same thing that I was talking about that I was hinting at earlier on. When we have our x character pointing at a specific address and our x integer pointing at the same address, when we write to the integer x, this is just a .o file, right? Weak library was compiled with the idea that there would be four bytes allocated to x, and that I could write, I could certainly write two bytes to it, and this actually writes four bytes. This writes them in little endian on our x86 processors. So it's going to wipe out those four values, and it's going to put two nine here, hex two nine, so zero x two nine, zero x three b, and then zero and zero. So. Now that we put those in here, we come back over here and we interpret those two var variables, hex 29 and hex 33b, 30b, as characters. So what happens there? Let's take a look at our handy dandy ASCII table. If we come into our ASCII table and we look at y, so that's that second variable, 3b, so we look at y, so decimal 3b, no, hex 3b, is semicolon, and hex 29 is 
close parentheses. That gives us our ASCII smiley, ASCII winky face. Now what's that next uh, watch variable there? So with watch expressions, I can take anything that I can interpret in the C language and just tell it to look at it. What I did there was I said, okay, let's take the address of, so when we use the ampersand, what we're doing, switch back over here to my drawing from before, we're saying, okay, normally when we're talking about X, we're talking about the value stored at the address of X. But rather than talking about that value, I want to jump across and talk about the address of that variable. So I ask for the address of that variable. That gives me this 8,000 in my made up address space. And then I cast that 8,000 and say, rather than interpreting this as a pointer to a character, which is what I did in the first watch expression, the C debugger knows that X is interpreted as a character. And so it's gonna show me the integer value stored at that memory address. And then it's gonna show me the ASCII character stored at that address. When I said, what, I, what happened here is I said, okay, take that variable X, which you think is a character. Tell me what address it is. And rather than being a pointer to a character, I'm gonna force you to think about it as a pointer to an integer. When I look at it as a pointer to an integer, and I dereference it. Now, dereference is the opposite of that address of function. So that brings me back over. It says, look at this as an integer and then dereference it. And that will tell us to look at this entire thing. And if we were to go into our handy dandy programmers calculator and we type in in decimal, Let's, what do we want to type in in decimal? 15145, 15145. And then we look at the hex value, it's 3B29. So that makes sense. The watch variable is keeping track of that as if it were an integer. And it is telling us, yep, the thing that we set in weak library, 3B29 is what's stored in X if we thought of X as an integer, as opposed to thinking of it as a character. This is all to say that A, Thinking about things in terms of L values and R values is super useful, and I'm going to do it very often during this class. And B, C is horrible. T, like, okay, I'll talk to you next. No, just kidding. C is very, very low level, and it is very, very trusting of the programmer that what they're trying to do, no matter how illogical or confusing it could be, is the right thing to do. And again, this is what causes it to be famous for foot gun language. A lot of people will say C is foot gun. And if you see somebody say C is Footgun, you're like, oh yeah, I know what that means. Totally, totally. I'm in the cool kids group. Yeah, I am. You are. If you're, if you're watching this, you're in the cool kids group. No question. Cool. Let's see what happens next. So that's one of the confusing things about the C compiler and the C linker. Another amazing co confusing thing about the C linker is on this slide where the C linker does kind of like a one pass over everything that you put at the command line. And it does what I have right here on the slide. It says, as I go through each of these files, I'm gonna pick up references, things that I need to eventually resolve. And while I'm picking them up, I'm keeping track of them. And as I find symbol definitions, I'm gonna say, okay, I found this one. Like, okay, I found this one. Okay, I found this one. And I'm gonna follow those rules about weak symbols and strong symbols and figuring out which one when we disambiguate them, yada, yada, all that fun stuff. However, it only goes through once and it doesn't remember anything over the course of it if it's not a reference that needs to be resolved. So if I were to say, here's every single library function, here's fprintf and here's standard error and here's standard out and here's this and puts and blah, 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 blah. If I don't know what I'm looking for yet, the, the linker is just gonna be like, oh cool, that's a function. Oh cool, that's a function. Oh cool, that's a function. And it's not gonna remember them because it didn't think it needed to. Then it gets over to your .c file that got compiled into a .o file. It says, oh, all of a sudden it needs something from this libsum library. Okay, cool, I guess that's a thing we need to do. And it doesn't find them because it went through libsum and it tried to figure things out. It was like, okay, I don't need this. I don't need this, I don't need this. Then all of a sudden it finds something that says, yeah, you needed that sum, that function, that sum function. And it gets to the end of the list and it says, hey, I'm broke. 
It doesn't work. I was looking for a sum function. You didn't give it to me. You did give it to them. You just have to remember that it scoops things up before it looks for them. Yes. So you need to put your files first that use the later files. That's all there is to it. So we've got this main broken here where we put the library inclusion on the build command before the main.c that used it. And that will break. That will just say, I couldn't find some, the, the function sum. Likewise, if we flip these up, if we say, okay, here's main, what the builder is going to do here is it's going to use the compiler to turn main.c into main.o. When it turns it into main.o, it's going to have that rel text section in it. And that rel text is going to say, yeah, I need some. And so the linker knows because it's going through this file by file that it has on its to-do list of things it needs to find. One of them is the sum that got referenced but is currently undefined in that file. And then when it hits the L sum part there, when it actually pulls in the library that got created, it's going to go through that library. It's going to say, aha, here's sum. I'm going to do my disambiguation. I'm going to follow my strong symbol, weak symbol rules. I found the sum. It is the thing that I referred to earlier. Everything is right with the world. I'm going to put this together and I'm going to have a fixed functional program. So that is the other confusing thing that we have here. It's a little bit annoying because it's like, you know, do we really use C that much in the real world nowadays? Yeah, it gets used a good amount. And you do have to be aware of these things, but it feels more like they're just mistakes. They're just like imperfections. Like you don't have to deal with the, these types of these specific shenanigans in C++. You certainly don't have to deal with them in Python or JavaScript. Each of these languages does have their own special you know, properties, but they don't have this one. This one's very, very nasty. Uh, one reason that I think it's important to look at this stuff, even if it's not going to be exactly relevant to your daily job, although it will be to a lot of people's, is that seeing how something breaks down and trying to dissect it and understand the weirdness is a really, really great skill to have because your code or somebody else's code, it's going to do weird things. It's going to do unexpected things that are a little bit illogical, but the person that wrote them either didn't understand what was going on and thought they knew what was happening, or they had a good reason for that and they trusted you in a way that maybe they shouldn't have or that was a little bit confusing and it's going to be your responsibility to, to figure it out. So that's symbol resolution, folks. Symbol resolution depends on binding, whether they're local or global. It depends on their strong weak. It can still screw up in a couple of weird ways, but it's what we've got. This is how we go from we've got a .o file to we have an actual plan for bring this thing in from here, put it here. Bring this thing in from here, put it here. And that's what we're going to see in the next lecture. We're going to see how to actually fix up these references and relocate all these files and turn them into a final, complete, ready to run executable. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.